Grammar Girl is brought to you by Magoosh. Do your career goals require you to take a standardized test like the GRE or GMAT? Magoosh Online Test Prep provides you with the tools you need to get a great score, like study schedules, up-to-date practice questions, video lessons, and support from expert tutors. Study anywhere, anytime, on desktop or mobile. Visit magoosh.com and enter the promo code GRAMMAR for a 20% discount. Grammar Girl here. I'm Mignon Fogarty. This week, in honor of Mother's Day, which is Sunday in the United States, I have a meaty middle about capitalization in general and also when to capitalize words such as mom and mother. And I have a second meaty middle about why we say someone is in the doldrums. But first, I have a correction from last week. Neil Babcock on Twitter pointed out that I said the summary of the quick and dirty tip backwards at the end of one of the segments last week. So just to be clear, think of Americans as bald. If you're in America, people tell bald-faced lies. And if you're in Britain, people tell bare-faced lies. Thanks, Neil. Also, we had some fun follow-ups to the mixed metaphor and hyphen segments. Funny mixed metaphors readers shared include a stitch in time is worth a pound of cure, like a loose cannon in a china shop, beating your head against a dead horse, and my favorite, it's like pulling teeth from a baby. (laughs) And Peter Stephen on Twitter wrote, quote, On hyphens, I'm a football fan, and this time of year there's lots of news about players re-signing. But newspapers drop the hyphen all the time. Resigning is the complete opposite of re-signing, unquote. Good point. Thanks, Peter, and thanks to everyone for the comments. And now, on to capitalization. Scribes writing with the early Roman alphabet didn't have to choose between uppercase and lowercase letters, because there were no lowercase letters. All the letters were what we think of today as capitals. Lowercase letters came much later, as did the names uppercase and lowercase. In 1382, the Wycliffe Bible was the first written reference to mention capital letters, according to the Oxford English Dictionary. The terms uppercase and lowercase came later and reflected the way compositors arranged the boxes that held the individual letters used in printing. The larger letters were literally stored in an upper case, and the smaller letters were stored in a lower case, along with the type for punctuation and spaces. In addition to giving us the names uppercase and lowercase, printers also played a role in standardizing English capitalization. When compositors were turning handwritten manuscripts into printed documents, they often faced indecipherable handwriting, so they simply made their own decisions about which words should be capitalized. These early printers started the practice of capitalizing all nouns in English, a trend that has since fallen away, but that was prominent in the 18th century. In fact, the U.S. Constitution, written in 1787, not only codifies the birth of our nation, but also serves as an easily accessible example of capitalized common nouns. Capitalization styles shifted so much and so quickly that by the 1830s, writers were favoring lowercase letters, not only for common nouns, but also for many things we'd capitalize today. The reasons for the change are mysterious. The prominent usage writer H.L. Mencken speculated that the change was, quote, probably as a result of French influence, unquote. During this time, writers sometimes kept days of the week and courtesy titles lowercase. For example, they may have written about meeting Mr. Mencken on Wednesday with Mr. and Wednesday lowercase. And then I found a snippet in a later book from 1894 called The Dictionary of Printing and Bookmaking, in which the author Wesley Washington Pascoe bemoaned that librarians had become, quote, wearied with the difficulty of applying an exact rule to every case, unquote, and were insisting that the only words that should be capitalized were words at the beginning of sentences and words that were strictly proper nouns. 
These were times of great change. Today, of course, we capitalize Mr. and Wednesday and keep words such as power, age, and years lowercase, all three of which are capitalized in the Constitution. The most basic modern capitalization rule is to capitalize proper nouns and keep common nouns lowercase. A proper noun is the name of a person or thing, whereas a common noun is a generic descriptor. Therefore, we write about the Golden Gate Bridge with bridge capitalized, and the orange bridge that crosses the bay with bridge lowercase. It quickly gets complicated, though. For example, we know that we capitalize someone's name, for example, Juliet, but what about a nickname? Nicknames are capitalized, so if you always call Juliet Northy because she's from Alaska, you'd capitalize Northy the same way you'd capitalize Juliet. Hey, Juliet, do you want to go to the movies tonight? Hey, Northy, do you want to go to the movies tonight? In those examples, Juliet and Northy are both capitalized. On the other hand, you may call your husband Honey, but you don't capitalize Honey the same way you'd capitalize a nickname. It's considered a term of endearment, and those aren't capitalized. The difference can be subtle. One trick for telling the difference between a nickname and a term of endearment is to test whether you'd use the term when talking to someone else. If you were talking to your visiting sister about your husband, would you say, Honey called and said he'd pick up dinner on the way home? If not, honey is a term of endearment, and you don't capitalize it. But I have met people who are called honey as a nickname, so it's not a universal rule that you don't capitalize honey. Mom and dad are similarly tricky. When they're descriptive, they're lowercase. And when they're used in place of a name, like a nickname, they're capitalized. In I told my mom you're coming over after school, mom is lowercase. But in will you check on mom next week, mom is capitalized. One quick way to determine whether you should capitalize mom or mother is to note whether you have a pronoun in front of the word because the pronoun is a clue that you're dealing with a descriptive term, not a replacement for someone's name. For example, mom is lowercase if you're saying, have you seen my mom lately? His mom always makes me feel welcome. And Judy went to visit her mom. We don't usually put pronouns in front of proper nouns. For example, if your mom's name is Shirley, you wouldn't say, have you seen my Shirley lately? If you're using mom the same way you'd use a name, such as Shirley, then you capitalize mom. Shirley is coming over for dinner tonight. Mom is coming over for dinner tonight. Like pronouns, if there's an article, such as the word the, in front of the word mom or mother, you don't usually capitalize the word. For example, if you're describing a scene in a play and write, the mom enters the stage from the left, Mom is lowercase because it's just a common noun. It would be the same as saying the boy enters the stage from the left. Finally, the official name of the holiday this Sunday is Mother's Day, mother apostrophe S. The founder, Anna Jarvis, intentionally made the name singular because she wanted people to honor their own mother. She didn't intend it to be a day of celebrating motherhood in general, and eventually she came to despise the commercialization of her invention so much that she tried to get the day abolished, to no avail. Nevertheless, happy Mother's Day to all the mothers out there. May your children always love you and know when to use apostrophes. A version of this article that I wrote originally appeared in Office Pro magazine. Before we get to this segment about the doldrums, thanks to our sponsor, StoryWorth. Everyone has a family member who tells the best stories, and StoryWorth makes it easy and fun for your loved ones to share those stories. Simply purchase a subscription for someone you love, and each week, StoryWorth emails that person a question about their life. They reply with their story, either by email, on the web, or in the app, And after a year, their stories are bound into a beautiful hardcover printed book, black and white interior with a color cover. And don't worry, the data is secure and everything is private by default. It's a great way to connect with your family, bridge geographic distances, and learn about your relatives. 
Plus, StoryWorth makes it easy to preserve your memories and pass them on to your children and their future families. It's a great gift for Mother's Day or Father's Day, even last minute. I got it for my dad last year and thought the prompts were really interesting and insightful. It would make a great Mother's Day gift. And for $20 off when you subscribe, visit storyworth.com slash grammar. That's storyworth.com slash grammar. And now, on to the doldrums. Have you ever felt like you were in the doldrums? If so, it probably didn't feel too good. You may have been sluggish or sleepy, uninspired or downright depressed. But did you know your murkiness was mirrored in the ocean? That's because the doldrums are a real place. The doldrums are a wide band of water on either side of the equator. They're known for being hot, windless, and still. The fancy name for this region is the ITCZ, the Intertropical Convergence Zone. What's converging there are two opposing trade winds, one from the northern hemisphere blowing to the southwest, and one from the southern hemisphere blowing northeast. The intense heat at the equator warms these trade winds and pushes them straight up, just like heat causes a hot air balloon to rise. Because the air currents are rising up instead of crossing the ocean's surface, there's very little wind in this region, and there's not much current. In fact, before the days of machine power, ships were known to get stuck in the doldrums for weeks on end. Here's a description of what that might have been like from Patrick O'Brien's Aubrey Maturin series. Even at night, heat seemed to emanate from the bloody moon, and during the oppressive, stifling days, the sun, even from behind its frequent low cloud, made the pitch bubble in the seams of the deck and the tar melt so that it dripped from the upper rigging. The heat worked right down into the lowest depths of the ship, making the bilge water stink most vilely, so that those whose cabins lay far below had but little sleep. A similar description was written more than 200 years earlier, when Samuel Taylor Coleridge penned The Rime of the Ancient Mariner. The poem tells of a ship cursed by a sailor's foolish decision to shoot down on albatross, a large white seabird. He had, quote, killed the bird that made the breeze to blow, unquote, and the ship was soon mired in the doldrums. Here's how Coleridge described it. Day after day, day after day, we stuck, nor breath nor motion, as idle as a painted ship upon a painted ocean. Water, water, everywhere, and all the boards did shrink. Water, water, everywhere, nor any drop to drink. I'm sure you've heard those lines before. I had, but I never knew they were from this poem. Note that the doldrums indeed are a specific place, that belt we discussed, some five degrees above and below the equator. But they can also refer more generally to any place where the wind disappears and the ocean lies still, and figuratively to refer to anything that moves sluggishly. And by the way, what's the deal with that albatross? Let's pause to say that they're pretty interesting creatures. They have the longest wingspan of any bird out there, up to 11 feet. They can glide over the ocean for hours without resting or even flapping their wings. And they drink salt water. Who can do that? And they live for up to 50 years. Albatross sometimes follow ships in hopes of gathering handouts or trash thrown overboard and old-time sailors considered them a good omen, and considered it unlucky to kill them. In the rhyme of the ancient mariner, the sailor who kills the albatross is blamed for the ship's troubles. His shipmates hang the dead albatross around his neck, and he's forced to wear it as he watches his shipmates die of heat and starvation around him. He wears the albatross until one moonlit night he sees sea snakes swimming in tracks of shining white. In the midst of his despair, a spring of love gushes from his heart, and he blesses them. In that moment, the albatross falls from his neck and sinks like lead into the sea. Coleridge gives us a metaphor for carrying a great weight of guilt and the relief that can come when it falls away. To have an albatross around one's neck means that your psychological burden, the weight of something you did in the past, hangs heavy on you. 
It prevents you from moving forward, succeeding, or flourishing. In fact, if you have an albatross around your neck, you're also likely in the doldrums, dull and listless at best, immobilized at worst. On that note, people, go bless some sea snakes and let your spirits rise. That segment was written by Samantha Enslin, who runs Dragonfly Editorial. You can find her at dragonflyeditorial.com and on Twitter as Dragonfly Edit. Remember, if you'd like an ad-free version of this podcast, access to the entire ad-free archive of about 600 episodes, and an exclusive monthly bonus episode, you can get all that through Stitcher Premium. Sign up for a free trial to get not only all my goodies, but stuff from other great podcasts too, like Marvel's Wolverine The Long Night, and more than 100 comedy albums. Sign up at stitcherpremium.com slash grammar and use the offer code grammar. Finally, I have a mystery I'd love to solve. It looks as if someone in Indiana bought almost 1,400 copies of my book, Grammar Girl Presents the Ultimate Writing Guide for Students. But that's all I can tell. So first, thank you, whoever you are. And second, I'd love to know who you are and why you bought so many books. If you can, find me and say hello. I'm Grammar Girl on Twitter and Facebook. And thanks again. I'm Mignon Fogarty. That's all. Thanks for listening.